Hi, welcome to update three. Sorry, it's it's been a while. I've I've had a rough year the past year. I well, it's kind of embarrassing to talk about, but I became addicted to placebos. Yeah, it started out innocently. You know, I was in a pharmaceutical drug trial, and I was in the control group. And the next thing you know, I'm popping six packs of Tic Tacs a day. My friends were telling me, you know, these things aren't doing anything for you. And I said, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But anyway, I'm uh, I'm chewing some gum now, and I think think I've pretty much got it kicked. So, so we're going to keep the online classes going. Here's a quick update. Uh, 101 Part 2 we've been working on forever. Well, last summer, we finished the videos, and we uploaded them to the platform. So they're ready to go. And I just need to write all the homeworks and the exam problems. And normally I can do that. When I ran my first class, I did it week by week when we used to run the classes live. But the problem is the class I teach on campus this year, I decided that I was going to write all my own problems for it. Because I don't like the commercially available uh, homework solutions. And it's very useful for me to write the problems because then I really am covering exactly what I want. Anyway, so I did that all year. Uh, I wrote 268 homework problems into our local learning management system, and the part of my brain that writes problems is completely saturated. I couldn't think of any more problems for 101 Part 2. But the good news is, that class is over. They're all written and done. I'll never have to do it again. And now the part of my brain that writes problems is like ripped. I mean, it's ready to go. So I'm going to crank out 101 Part 2 as fast as possible. It's definitely going to come out this summer. Other news on uh, online courses in edX, you may have read a few months ago how edX is going into a financial model where the entire class isn't free anymore. So you do have to now pay the $25 or $50 in most classes to get full access. So we are going to start doing that with 101 Part 2. We want to do our part to uh, help keep edX uh, going. So 101 Part 2, you can still audit it for free and you'll have access to the uh, videos, the lectures, and the lecture problems to do them as you go, see if you're understanding. But to see the homework and the exams, you'll need to pay for the, the certificate at, at the 25 or 50 rate. I think since we have it in two parts, maybe we can do it at 25. Um, that's the plan. Now, if you're in a current class, so currently we're running AP 1, 101, Part 1, and 102, Part 1, those are currently free. So even if you sign up now, uh, those are being run with, with no cost to see the homework and the exams. So if you're in those now, you need to finish them before they close, because when we reopen them, they'll be on the new pay model. So AP uh, 1 and 101 point, uh, Part 1 end July 30th of this year, and 102 Part 1 ends October 17th of this year. So if you're in those and you want to do it for free, you finish them, uh, because once we start relaunching, it'll be 25 or 50 to see sort of the whole thing. All being worked out. Couldn't be free forever. Let's see, on the last update, I told you that I was giving a talk at the APS meeting about student experiences in online courses, and I put out some surveys, and many of you were kind enough to answer those surveys, which I appreciate. So I thought I'd share with you a little bit of the results, kind of interesting. Here's a few slides from the talk I gave. And we asked the question, um, what resources did you feel you lacked, and what led you to use an online course? And the most popular was the lectures. It seems that people felt like they, they couldn't get uh, the lectures that they needed. It's not too surprising because physics teacher is sort of the hardest, one of the harder positions to fill at an educational institution, especially often in high school. So I wasn't too surprised people were looking for lectures, also because they're looking on the internet and that's where all the videos are. Um, second was problems. And that's not unique to online students. All students want more problems, more practice problems. Can you release a practice exam? I want a practice exam. I want another practice exam. Right, because they think doing problems is the key to understanding everything and figuring it out, which of course it isn't. But anyway, lectures and problems were the most popular, and then books and discussions and everything. But look at here, fun. Just for fun. That was encouraging that people are really interested in just learning physics for fun. So we looked at how it broke down in different parts of the world. So Africa mostly interested in lectures and problems, and they want to have fun. India, lectures and problems, and they want to have fun. The United States, lectures and problems, they want to have fun. Canada, lectures and problems, and they want to have fun. Central South America, same. East Asia, lectures and problems, want to have fun. So my conclusion is very promising. The entire world believes that physics is fun, and I could not be more excited. I presented some other uh, conclusions from this, but the main point was 
the struggles with learning physics are universal and there's really nothing regional or high resource or low resource about it. It seems that everybody gave pretty much the same answers. So thanks for answering the survey. It definitely made my talk um, better to have that data. Let's see, last time we posted the challenge problem about Houston. Let's see, it was how much latent heat is released when Houston freezes. So these are meant to be ambiguous. The answers are not in the courses. You might have to do some estimate calculations. That's, that's the point. So, so one person chimed in with lots of questions about what did I mean? And that's the point, is you figure out what I meant. They're called Fermi problems in some, some groups. That's, Fermi was famous for coming up with these. That's kind of what these are. So uh, for this one at the time, uh, Houston was getting very cold and we were about to have a multi-day freeze, which is very unusual here. And so that was the question, how much latent heat is released? So you'd have to think about two things. One is, what does it really mean for a city to freeze? When the weather person says it's gonna freeze, what do they mean? And two, what is latent heat? All right, so let's take those in order. A city is already frozen. All the concrete is solid, all the steel pipes are solid, everything's solid, what, what do we, well, of course we mean the water. The freezing point means a freezing point of water, and it's when you get below that point is what they mean by a freeze. So it has more of a biological impact, really. Um, so talking about the freezing water in Houston, and then latent heat is sort of the heat that is either absorbed or released when a material goes through a phase transition. So if you think about something like ice, you have to uh, add heat to ice to warm it up. If you want to go from, say, minus 30 degrees to minus 20 degrees, you got to add some heat. Minus 20 to minus 10, you got to add some heat. But when you go from the crystalline solid to the sort of disordered liquid, it takes heat to do that, even though you don't actually change the temperature. So latent heats are the heat that is released or absorbed uh, when the temperature doesn't change at a phase transition. So when uh, Houston freezes, the energy that was in all the motion of the atoms that is, is, goes away when it becomes a crystalline solid. So you release latent heat, all right? So the two things for this problem are one, how much water is in Houston, and then just calculate the latent heat. So my rough numbers, well then you have another decision. What do you mean by the water in Houston? Do we mean the municipal water and the lakes and the bayous, which is what we call drainage ditches here, or do we mean like the groundwater? So to me it means the groundwater. You know, the, the municipal kind of water and the water supply, that doesn't really melt or freeze because you know it's kept warm and it's circulating and a few pipes freeze. But really, it's all the water moisture in the ground and little puddles that are going to freeze. So to estimate that, I said, well, the area of Houston is 1,600 uh, square kilometers. And I looked up some soil sites. And there's about, when, water, when the soil is saturated, there's about 150 millimeters of water, like high, in the soil a meter deep. So let's say a meter deep is what we care about. The ground's not usually saturated. So I said about uh, 50 millimeters of water is in the soil down to a meter deep where it freezes. So you multiply that out, and I have my numbers here, I didn't memorize them. And uh, I came up with about eight times 10 to the seven meters cubed of water, which is about eight times 10 to the 10 kilograms of water. The latent heat of freezing of water is, look it up in a table, it's 334 kilojoules per kilogram. So when you put all that together, I got about three times 10 to the 13 kilojoules is released as latent heat when Houston freezes. So let's see who got it right. The first person to chime in was Midgic, who is one of our uh, uh, online TAs, uh, prolific, years of service. We appreciate him very much. Came with a very serious answer that he tried to look up the latent heat of Houston and looked between helium and hydrogen and nothing was there. So, okay, very funny. And then Maria uh, in 101X, she went through my exact numbers almost. We had almost the exact same process and she got the exact same answer I got. So we're going to say that's correct. Although she did it in kilocals, so about 6 times 10 to the 11 uh, kilocals. And uh, so good job, Maria. And Julian, um, he actually did a little different. He said, let's go with the lakes and streams and municipal water. So he estimated how much of that would freeze. One of his estimates involved ice fishing. How deep you have to drill for ice fishing. Well, there's not much ice fishing that happens in Houston, but still, whatever. He, he got some good numbers. He actually got about the same amount of water as me and uh, Maria, and he got about the same answer. So all three of us with about the same answers. So that's some pretty good estimating. Okay, final part of this update is the new challenge problem. This one is not quantitative, this one is just qualitative. I am showing you a video, and you see something on the left, and you see something on the right. And the simple question is, how are these related? 
that's it. I'll see you next time. Won't be a year. I promise it won't be a year. <laughs>